Hey, what's going on? It's uh, Let There Be Talk episode, what, 754 on the June 10th. June, wait, yeah, June 10th? Wait a minute, yeah. Hey, big happy birthday to Bill Burr today. Everybody go to his uh, Instagram and his Twitter, aka X or whatever it's called, and wish him a happy birthday. The man is 56 years old today, out fucking kicking ass, slinging some of the most uh, incredible one hour of comedy fire that I've heard in years. And uh, he deserves all the love. So hit him up. Happy birthday, my man, Bill Burr. So uh, speaking of Bill Burr, we just got back from the road. We were out for, what were we out? For like four days. We went to Denver, Colorado for two days, Wednesday, Thursday. Then we had a Friday off and then uh, flew to Berkeley, California on Saturday and did the Greek. And man, it does not get any uh, any better than this last week on the road here. Straight up, just just heaven. You're doing comedy. You're hanging out with your best friends, Club Soda Kenny, and uh, the great Bill Burr. We're just out there, just I, just bringing some smiles to people. Man, that's really what's been going on the last year and a half. This tour is kind of winding down. There's four dates in a couple weeks at San Jose Civic I will be on with Bill. And then he goes to Seattle to the Moore Theater to shoot his brand new special. And then uh, that'll be the end of this incredible year and a half uh, of just dream come true stuff. Unbelievable. You know, the Garden, the the Hollywood Bowl, the Greek in uh, Berkeley last night or Saturday night. It was Saturday night. I don't even know where I'm at right now, but I feel good. I feel, I feel good. Do, 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 do. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of beat up right now. My neck and shoulders. I, I'll give you the kind of the itinerary. We flew out to Denver and we did the Belco arena the first night on Wednesday, which was the very first arena I ever did eight years ago, opening for Bill. And uh, it's wild to think about that, how fast that has gone by. And then the next night we did the Belco Arena. And then the Friday we had a day off. And ever since I've been uh, friends with Bill, he, you know, he wanted to learn to ride. So I taught him to learn to ride years ago. And then he had kids and he tapped out of riding, which is fucking very wise. You know, I think after he saw me uh, laying in my bed, with broken ribs and dislocated shoulder and neck and fucking smashed ankle. He was like, I think I'm good, you know? But then in the last year or so, he's kind of gotten the fire again. And he, he was like, look, I want to ride, but I want to ride with nobody around. I want to ride way out somewhere like Wyoming or, or in the mountains in Vancouver. And then I was like, wait a minute. We can hit up my man, Jason, who I had on the podcast. Remember that the CEO of Ducati and he's out there in Denver and maybe we can get some bikes from Ducati and go way out into the red rocks, uh, up there into the Rockies past the red rock amphitheater and keep going. I had done part of that ride before with Rick Lewis, the great legendary morning rock DJ out in Denver who was also one of the voices for the Broncos. So I had done that ride years ago and realized how beautiful it was. And I thought, well, this could be the perfect place. So I called up Jason. He said, let's do it. Jason mapped out one of the most incredible rides. And uh, we met up with him Friday morning, had a little breakfast at my favorite place in Denver, Snooze. Love it. Nice and clean food. If you're looking for uh, some great, great, morning breakfast food in Denver, which by the way, they got rid of my fucking favorite thing, the quinoa porridge. I remember one time I was complaining on, uh, on, on Twitter. Hey, snooze, you got rid of the best thing on your menu. And they're like, boo hoo, like full clowned me. Like who cares? I was like the balls, the balls. But, um, 
So we met up with Jason. Now I have not rode in five years. Um, I mean, I rode one, like an hour on the track out in Austin when Bill and I went to the Moto GP uh, a couple years ago. Uh, but other than that, I had the neck surgery and I just, I'm not really, you know, shouldn't be riding. You can't have a helmet or a backpack on me. I had that, uh, that, that, herniated disc between c5 and c6 which is where that um back bit if you've seen me live that back bit is uh has originated from that's where it comes from i don't want to be one of those back people <laughs> so i had not rode in years uh, a long a long you know long ride a long ride takes a lot out of you you got to be in shape and you have to have the right motorcycle to ride like four, five, six, seven hours a day and not be all beat up. So Jason showed up and I was fired up for Bill. You know, it's his birthday weekend. Here it is. It's going to be the dream come true. He's going to get to ride through the Rockies. We're going to be out on these Ducatis and, uh, and just enjoy the wilderness with no one out there. And Jason showed up. He came with two Diavels, which are great, great kind of town riding or half day rides. Low bike, big 240 rear tire, real smooth and uh, mid control. So Bill will be low to the ground and have his feet flat on the on the pavement at stoplights. That is the most um, most necessary thing for new riders to feel like the bike's not too tall and uh cuz that'll it, you know if you come up to a stoplight and you put your foot down and and you don't have full flat foot you could fall over shit happens that's why a lot of people don't ride those big tall uh BMW GS adventure bikes uh stuff like that now the bike i rode is very tall but i had rode this bike for years and i'd been riding for 35 years and i like to be up tall so I can look over cars with mid control. So my legs aren't out in the fucking wind, like sails and straight ahead handlebars or up a little bit kind of ape hangers or T bar style. So I was on the, uh, the Ducati Multistrada, um, Gran Turismo. Now I've owned three Multistradas, but this one has the newest technology and the V4 engine. And I'm going to tell you this right now. We were riding and um, I was pretty much laughing the whole time I was riding. I kept saying this over and over. I can't believe how fucking great this Multistrada is. The engine power, the maps, the fueling maps, the old Multistradas, they had to like, detune them all shitty to get them into the United States because of admissions. So you roll on the gas and be like, uh, 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 uh. it's just really awful. And then eventually they kind of got the fueling maps together, but now it is a whole fucking different game. They got shit on there like uh, electronic suspension. So when you come up to a light, the bike will let the preload out and drop way down so you can be flat footed at a light. And as soon as you roll the gas on, the bike goes back up to the high riding position. Unbelievable was blowing my mind. The different maps, the sport, the enduro, the, uh, the adventure riding mode, all these different modes, touring. It was incredible. You put it on sport, that thing would fucking come up. You put it on touring and you just roll the throttle on real hard. And it's just the way that engine comes on. It is by far my new favorite engine I've ever rode on a motorcycle. Uh, the one before this, that was my favorite was the six cylinder BMW um, GTL, which I had owned and rode all the way to uh, Sturges and stuff like that. But this engine, and it's the same engine that's in the Diavel. It is unbelievable the advancements in motorcycles these days and the advancements in Ducati. 
what they have going. You can shift now with no clutch. You know, you can just speed shift like they have on the um, on the Moto GP. Just ba 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 ba. It's it's crazy. You can downshift and upshift with no clutch out of first gear. Once you're out of first gear, I couldn't believe what I was riding, and immediately it was getting me in my head of like I gotta have a fucking bike again. And the other thing that has advanced in technology since I had stopped riding the last five years is the communication Bluetooth systems in the helmets is so fucking mind boggling. I mean, this is one of the greatest things I've ever had riding. And I wish I had it all those years of riding to Sturgis, being able to talk to each other back and forth no problem, seamless. You could hear him perfect. Everything. It was crazy. Like I, I talk to myself a lot when I'm riding. Like I kept, I kept going. Like I can't fucking believe this bike. And at one point, Burr was talking to himself. He missed a shift. He was like, "Nope, nope, nope. That was fucking wrong. Did that wrong. Fuck." And he was beating himself up. I go, "Huh?" He goes, "Oh, what? What? Oh, oh, I was talking to myself. I." I I, I, I was shifting wrong and it was funny because you're just you're just in your own head out in the fucking Rockies riding once in a while you'd be like oh whoa look at that fucking house you know I'll tell you that one of the darkest darkest thoughts I had and uh, I told the guys after we got home safe and sound from riding the communications on the helmets is is kick ass but all I kept thinking was man if somebody goes down, you are going to hear their horrific last words, their crash. Like, you know, you're just riding like, oh, yeah, check out that fucking elk over there. Oh, no. I love you guys. I mean, that is a goddamn dark thought. That was going through my head. When I was riding, like, ooh, fuck. I don't, I, I wouldn't want to hear somebody, you know? So that, that was an interesting thought to have. But uh, thank God we fucking rode safe. And uh, all I really cared about was that Bill got back safe. He's got a fucking family. Me and Jason, we, you know, we're just a couple fucking, you know, dirty bikers out there. It's not going to matter if we go down. But him, you know, he's got a wife, kids got family. So we got him back safe and sound. And uh, we rode about five hours on Friday through the Rockies. Then we came back and got back to the hotel. And I tell you what, I was fucking done. Like I was at the gym all day and immediately my, I need a motorcycle again. That went away because my neck was sore, my left shoulder. And sure, I was not in riding shape, but I'm in great shape. And I know uh, I'm not supposed to ride or no roller coasters. That's what the doctor told me after the neck surgery. No helmets, no backpacks. And so I really miss roller coasters and I miss motorcycles. But I don't miss riding every day. I rode every day out of necessity, no car. And I was doing comedy and I did, you know, thousands of spots on the motorcycle. And after this, uh, this four hour ride, I was thinking like, God damn, I'm ready for bed. I laid down. I threw some fucking tiger bomb on my neck and shoulders. <laughs> also, my helmet was a size large. I should have went XL. It was doing the old push in the fucking skull, just crushing the skull. But out of the excitement of riding, I was ignoring it. Like that's not there. But when we were about 20 minutes back from home, my neck, my neck and my head and my fucking shoulder we're all going like hey dummy don't be doing this again for a long time <laughs> man i don't miss riding out of necessity but man there is nothing better than just a couple of buddies two three guys i don't think any more than three guys is great to ride with because then you start getting i need to piss i need gas Oh, my fucking blah, blah, blah. But if you got two or three guys and you're out riding in the middle of fucking nowhere, it is just 
beautiful. Just that mind release and that bonding uh, between the, the guys, girls, whoever's out there riding and just stopping. You're, you're drinking a water, talking like, man, yeah, fucking, this bike's great. Oh, fuck, what about that fucking thing? You know, you just get into it. I will give a huge shout out to Ducati and once again, this Multistrada. I was telling Jason, I cannot talk this bike up enough. Oh, by the way, real quick, got a sponsor, XBET. That's right. If you're passionate about sports and looking for a thrill, you need to check out the freshly redesigned website, XBET. They're calling it the last sports book you'll ever join. I've been playing on XBET. And they really do have it all, whether it's odds on basketball, combat sports, or even betting on the next Bitcoin dip. The best part is when you win, you get paid quick. But it's not just about placing bets. XBet is a whole experience. They support athletes and sports shows just like ours, and they give back to the community with tons of free bets and cash prize contestants. Um, did I mention that they also have a casino now. XBet is a casino. Spin the slots, play some roulette, or try your luck at the live tables, all from your mobile platform that lets you enjoy the fun on the go. Whether you're super into sports betting or just curious about trying it out, you need a site that will make it fun and easy. That's why you've got to check out XBet. X-B-E-T. Sign up today and use the code Promo, that's P-R-O-M-O. -O. That is the promo code, promo, and get a generous bonus of up to $1,000 on your first deposit. That's right. Promo code is promo, P-R-O-M-O, -O, for a free cash bonus to kickstart your betting journey. With so many great UFC cards on the horizon and baseball season in full swing, there's never been a better time to play. Make your bet X bet code is promo P R O M O. All right. Look at that. It's fucking sponsor like a real show. Huh? Woo. Back to the story. So Jason set up this ride and uh, I had no idea where we were going, but as we were putting on the helmets, he goes, we'll ride for a couple hours up to the Stanley hotel and um, we'll get lunch up there. And the Stanley Hotel, I go, wait a minute. That's where the shine, that's where Stephen King wrote The Shining and got the inspiration from that. And he goes, Yeah, and I've always wanted to go there. I was supposed to do a comedy show there about five years ago. It didn't happen. They were doing shows there in the ballroom, and you could stay the night in the hotel. I'm like, oh my God, this is going to be fucking epic. So we're riding for about an hour and a half, and then we come down this long long beautiful canyon and on the right there's like a lake with kick-ass like vacation homes that looks like something i'd want to live in in a couple years and disappear completely <laughs> and then up to the right on the hill there it is the famous fucking stanley hotel the inspiration for the greatest stanley kubrick film ever the shining and i mean I am just fucking psyched. Hold on. Got to fix this. Somebody's fucking hit me up on the goddamn computer. Let's get rid of that right now. Bam. That's out of there. See how I do that? Sorry, guys. Show sometimes professional. Sometimes it's not. I fucking run it all on my own. You know what I mean? You know what I mean, Vern? So there it is. The Stanley. So many questions. I'm like, wait a minute. We rode down that canyon, and there's a bunch of houses and a little little town area here. I don't remember that, you know. I remember Jack is driving out in that Volkswagen, and it's just a, a long, long road through mountains with nothing. And then there was the hotel. So, of course, I always knew that it wasn't filmed inside the Stanley, that they had built a set and they wanted it to look like the Awani Hotel in Yosemite, where I was born. And, uh, you know, my mom worked at the Awani and, and I know the Awani, I love it. And it is pure 
architectural beauty. So I knew it wasn't filmed in there, but I was like, wait, well, they were driving up and there was nothing there. Did they build all this shit since then? And I was like, it can't be. So I dove down into the rabbit hole and found out that, uh, you know, of course, Stephen King was inspired to write The Shining from the Stanley. But when Stan when um, uh, Kubrick got a hold of it, he decided that he was going to use uh, the Timberland Lodge in out, out in Oregon, Mount Hood, as its um, as its exterior, and then the drive you see up is not even the drive up to the hotel there. That's in Montana, and I looked that up. That's out there in um, going going to the Sun Road in Montana. So it's three, four different places. Cause I know the bar scenes were filmed here in LA at this Elks Lodge kind of next to the Hollywood Bowl where, you know, Jack's at the bar, your money's no good here. So the film, of course, that's the beauty of filmmaking. It's all over the place. The sets were uh, in the UK in England and um, it was considered one of the biggest movie sets ever built for this time. But the hotel is completely the inspiration. And it's even crazier uh, when you go there and you find out all the shit, dumb and dumber, of course. But I never knew this. There was a big picture of Bob Dylan. And on the Rolling Thunder tour, the entire band lived at the Stanley for two weeks and rehearsed there. That's where they rehearsed for the Rolling Thunder tour. And I was thinking, man, that is fucking history right there. There's nothing cooler than Bob Dylan in the 70s staying at the Stanley with Joan Baez and everybody. And and uh, I remember seeing the Rolling Thunder documentary, and maybe I just don't remember that part, but to rehearse there for two weeks and get that tour fired up, unbelievable. We went into the Stanley. They got a maze out front, like a shrub maze um that they put together just for the tourist and they have incredible food i had some fucking tacos and and bill and jason had these uh shrimp salads they're giant clean eating you know denver hippie food it was nice we ate there jumped on the bikes and then proceeded to ride more uh through uh what was that called estes Colorado, Estes, Colorado. We went all over, man. We went into little towns that looked like uh, people living off the grid. You know, they looked at us. This one guy, giant beard, we're riding. He looked at us like, keep going. Keep going, you libertards. You don't come around here, or you'll pay the price. Looked like deliverance, man. There were places we were at. It was funny. We went to this one town. It was real small. And uh, Jason's like, this is like where... Uh, rich hippie kids, their parents send them to live here after they fucking flunked out of rehab a couple times. They just put them out here in this town. And, and as soon as he's saying that, we're just seeing like hippie kids walking around this fucking Colorado. I'm going to tell you this right now. I could easily live in Colorado. I've said it a million times. I love Boulder. I love Fort Collins. I love Denver. And some of these other spots, it is amazing how beautiful Colorado is. But holy shit, is it fucking hot there? You're up higher, so the sun is just right on your goddamn fucking shoulder like a parrot. It's just sitting there like, ah, sunblock. Ah. It is scorching. It was 99 the entire time we were in Denver. And thank God we went up to uh, 10,000 feet. In elevation, it got down to like 62 because, man, it is so fucking hot up there in Denver. It's, hot. it's going to be a scorcher summer. It is going to be a fucking flamethrower this summer. So, incredible couple of days in Denver. Unbelievable ride on these great, great fucking motorcycles. And then we caught a flight to uh, Oakland. And uh, rode, a, uh, rode a, a car ride over to, to Berkeley to do the Greek theater. Now, I grew up in the Bay Area. I have seen 
many, many concerts at the Greek. It is hands down one of the greatest outdoor venues in the United States, if you ask me, because it's small, 7,500 sold out. It is tight. It's like a straight up kind of wall, kind of like one of those throw them to the lions, one of those kind of arenas with concrete seats and everybody's like right fucking in there. It's a, it's like a mini Hollywood bowl, just a tight kick-ass fucking um, uh, venue. And up behind it, they've got student apartments. And I always remembered that every time I'd go to a concert, I'd see students oh, oh, with their windows open, just watching like Tom Petty or Wilco or Radiohead, just up there watching it. And I thought, well, those are great apartments until uh, you uh, a band plays you don't want to hear. Then you're just sitting in your house with like the loudest neighbor ever. You know how I'm uh, I'm already fucking pissed at any noise from a neighbor. Imagine you're just in your living room and you're hearing sound check from like fucking some band you can't set. Check, check, mic check. Let me hear the kick drum. Snare. Let me hear symbols. You're just in your fucking living room going, shut up. Here's something crazy. So they have the windows and the people can just watch the shows. But for Bill's show, they didn't want anybody filming. You know, he's about to shoot a special out at the Moore Theater in Seattle. So they put all these, these giant flags up, these black flags, like a hundred of them. And it just blocked their view perfectly. And uh, they wouldn't be able to film or anything. It was fucking awesome. I was like, hey, what's going on with those uh, flags? Now, Bill didn't do that. And, uh, and Kenny didn't do that. It was the venue. They were just respecting Bill. And uh, they wanted to make sure that, you know, no one leaked out some of the uh, new special. Which is fucking great. Thank you, Greek Theater. And another planet who was the promoter, Greg Perloff. I, 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 this are the old BGP people that I grew up with. Bam, there they are. They're uh, constantly promoting shows going against Live Nation. It was amazing to see Greg Perloff. And the most important thing was it was a venue that I had not done in the Bay Area. I have done all the venues now except for the Cow Palace. But the Greek really fucking knocked me out and i was really excited to do it you know uh, just as excited as the hollywood bowl because that's the greek that's my hometown come home you know i've done some amazing shows uh in the last couple of years in my hometown oakland arena uh, chase arena opening for metallica and uh and those those shows but this one was real special because Back in the day, I saw so many shows here that knocked me out. Tom Petty, uh, you know, Radiohead, like I said, Stone Temple Pilots with the Butthole Surfers. Um, but one that really sticks out to me was Wilco. And Wilco, at the time that I saw Wilco there, and still right now, Wilco, one of the greatest and one of my favorite bands of all time. And uh, it was that time where I sold Tweety a guitar at Real Guitars, uh, a Martin. And he uh, said, do you want to get on the list tonight? I said, yep. And he gave me uh, tickets and passes. And he even wrote about the guitar in his book. And I've talked about it years ago. This was a guitar that I wanted, but it had a little bit of a V-neck and I wasn't quite sure. Ah, fuck. It was a cannon. It was magic. I could tell every time I strummed it, it would just release fucking crushing songs. Just magic guitar. And even I believe Tweety said he was in, in a heavy writer's block at the time. And then he stumbles into real guitars, buys this Martin, and then writes another hundred songs. And he said that a lot of the songs he has uh, written over the years have been on that guitar. But Wilco, when I was there, at the venue yesterday was ringing in my head the whole time. Songs like she's a jar, which I put it up on my Instagram. You know, I just, I'm still fucking forward how much Wilco has moved me in my life. And, uh, 
even that cruel country a couple of years ago, that record was just mind boggler to me. Now I still haven't figured out the, the newest record over the last year or so, but that's okay. That could be a record. I come back to a few years from now and be like, Oh, Holy shit. This is the one. But Wilco, man, as I was on that stage in that venue, I was thinking about Jeff Tweedy and um, just how amazing that man is and his songwriting. And I got to tell you, man, it was one of the greatest nights of comedy for me and Bill. We just, we fucking loved it. Les Claypool came down with his wife. They were side stage laughing. I was nervous because Les was there. Les is really into, uh, you know, he's into like Monty Python, you know, English comedy. Usually when people are into English comedy, they look down a little bit on American comedy. Like, oh yeah, you got some dick and shit jokes. Yeah. Go ahead and tell your little, your little fart jokes. <laughs> and I always, I always want to uh, do good around Les. I fucking love him. And over the few, last few years, I feel like that we have uh, become, you know, pretty good friends. It was kind of weird when I interviewed him years ago. He's got that kind of a uh, snarky vibe of like, oh yeah, yeah. But really I learned over the years that he's just playing around. He's just having fun. And he is a fantastic human. And he is also, I'm gonna say this right now, a genius. He is one of the most incredible artists I've ever met and watched perform over the last, you know, 40 years of my life or whatever. I'm 58, so even longer. But since I saw Primus from the beginning and the older I get and the more and more I see him over the years and talk about him all the time, that band and that man are uh, unbelievable. And, you know, it's just an honor to see him over there laughing on the side of the stage, him and his wife. Great, great human. I love his family. Cage, his son is great. He's out making films and stuff. So... It was uh, it was nerve wracking because uh, I was ready. I Of course, I've been on the road for a year and a half with Bill doing these big, big rooms. I was ready, but I wanted to do good for Claypool. And uh, it was great. Les came out with me. I had this thought of like, we'll sneak out there and we'll sing happy birthday to Bill. So Bill goes, all right, that's it for me. And Les and I walk out and... Uh, you know, Bill's like, oh, shit, Les Claypool. You know, we introduce Les. And then I go, hey, let's all sing Bill Happy Birthday. And this fucking Greek theater, incredible crowd erupted in just a smoking loud happy birthday with so much love for Bill. It was great. It was great. And now I'm here. I'm here I am. Home. And uh, getting ready to... Uh, you know, go back out on the road next week or so with uh, Bill at San Jose Civic. Then I'm headlining at Acme, and I'm going to try to film it, and fuck it. I'm putting this shit out. It's two years old now. Some of it's two and a half years old. I'm getting this fucking material out of here. I'm going to try to put it on YouTube and just go that route, and I hope that everyone that listens to this podcast shares it and promotes it and, uh, you know, and, and does all of that to get, get it out there. I know I fucking bug you guys all the time, but you know, even the smallest thing, like I said, if you leave a review on this podcast, it keeps it in the top 50. It keeps it in the algorithm. Come on, leave a review on iTunes or subscribe to my YouTube channel, Dean Del Rey, and get ready for hopefully this uh, special out at Acme. I'm in Acme at Minneapolis. Um, get your tickets to see me four nights. I'm going to be headlining at the Blue Room in Springfield, Missouri. And I'm going to be at the Comedy Cellar in Las Vegas for seven nights in July. Just burning my fucking head off. Vegas was like 111 this weekend. Ooh, ooh party. So that's coming up, people. DeanDelRay.com. What else we got here? Oh, man. There was a, there's been some records released over the last couple of weeks that are fucking smoking. 
And one of them uh, is from uh, a band that I absolutely love called King Hannah. Now, King Hannah, I had on the podcast maybe three or four years ago. I don't know. I'm shitty with time. But King Hannah is this amazing uh, band. And it's uh, they're from the UK. And they have this heavy kind of David Lynch heroin music vibe. Like if David Lynch does a new film, he should just use King Hannah music for the whole soundtrack. Perfect Twin Peaks type of music. Mozzie Star vibe, that kind of thing. And speaking of Berkeley, that's a a Mozzie Star Bay Area band right there. But uh, King Hannah, I saw him a couple years ago in a club downtown. And uh, there wasn't a lot of people there. I was promoting the shit out of it. And I want people to hear this band, but man, now they have dropped a new record called, what is it, Big Swimmer? Hold on, I gotta get this because it is fucking fire. Hold on, let me find it. I'm almost 100% it's Big Swimmer, but I'm fucking dumb. Hold on here. King Hannah, Big Swimmer, okay? This record is so fucking good. Because it's got the King Hannah heroin vibe, but now it's got some Neil Young style guitar in there, like like uh, down by the river, long outro jams of distorted, you know, P nineties through a, a Fender Deluxe tweed amp. This fucking record, check it out. I want you guys. I'm going to give you three songs. And I guarantee you will be hooked on this record. Big Swimmer. Okay. King Hannah. First song is called Milk Boy. All right. Go to Milk Boy. Get that one. Then listen to The Mattress. Another great song title. It's just totally original. You know, not like I miss you, love, or burned, burned out on loving you. (laughs) <laughs> that was an old song I wrote Burned out on loving you Feeling the ill shade of blue You gotta wonder why You take it <laughs> Okay, so Milk Boy The Mattress And then you're going to song number five Suddenly Your Hand And you tell me there's no way you are not going to love this band. You tell me what you think. Answer on the uh, Instagram. Send it around to people because they're out on tour. And they're not coming to the West Coast this time, but they're doing some East Coast runs and stuff. And I'm going to have them back on for sure. I cannot tell you how much I fucking love this record. It really blew my mind. I put it on and I was just kind of chilling around the house. And by the third song, I was like, what the fuck? And I started the record over. I go, I need to sit down and give this record the proper respect. I'm going to cut my ADD out. I'm going to put it on the home speakers here and just engage. And God damn, it is great. 11 songs, just unreal. Okay, Big Swimmer came out a couple weeks ago. King Hannah, another great record, actually that people aren't talking about is the new Lenny Kravitz record. And this thing fucking is a scorcher. Let me get this here. I didn't even know it was out. Somebody uh, said, hey, man, what do you think of the new uh, Lenny Kravitz? And I was like, shit, is that out? I knew the single was out, you know. But uh, his record, it kicks ass also. Hold on, I want to get you the, I want to get this, because I'm a, I, you know, I am a huge Lenny fan. I never went away. I will love Lenny. I will check all his music all the time. And uh, he still looks dynamite. He is still crushing it. I can't believe how good Lenny Kravitz is. Which, by the way, I saw uh, Tiffany Haddish on uh, Howard Stern. I saw a clip. And uh, she was uh, she's talking to Howard. And Howard's like, yeah, man. Um, you know, uh, were you trying to go after uh, Leonardo DiCaprio? She's all, oh, yeah, I, I texted him, you know. They're just playing around. But then he said, what about Lenny Kravitz? She's all, oh, yeah, I want some Lenny. 
And I guess Lenny was on Howard Stern, said he hadn't had sex in nine years. Fucking guy is going spiritual. Spiritual. He is like, you know what? I look so good that there's not a woman out there that looks as good as me. So I'll just stare at myself. <laughs> he said he looks at the mirror each day is eating a fucking uh a fucking plum or a, an avocado and he's just like look at this look at this <laughs> anyway his record's called blue electric light <clears throat> remember he had that single tk421 but holy shit this song honey unbelievable and human Great fucking record, man. I'm I'm diving into it. These two records. Yeah, that's those are the records this week that uh are really excited excited me, man. I fucking love it. Lenny Kravitz and King Hannah. Oh, by the way, one quick thing. I was out in uh Denver and I've been going to the store there, and I've been going for years, and so I can't go without i can't go to uh denver without going there mw reynolds and they were a, a podcast sponsor years ago and his store is fantastic mark he has just got motorcycles he's got filson he has a uh, free note denim he has naked and famous denim he has uh guns in there like bird you know bird hunting equipment He's got an amazing dog. His shop is beautiful. He's got massive knowledge of denim and brands. And we always hit it off when we see each other. We just talk nonstop. I saw this denim in there, Raleigh, which is made in Raleigh, North uh, Carolina. And uh, it was pretty interesting to see their, um, their denim. And I'm a free note guy now. And... Uh, Thank God. I just love the free notes. I've been wearing a pair of brown ones and I've been wearing the, the blue denim. But the Raleigh looked pretty fucking cool. They had this one called the OG. It is huge money. I was like, wow, that's pretty fucking uh, ballsy. You're like twice the price of all the big brands, the, the biggest brands. You're twice the price of free note, which is wild. But, um, had some interesting uh, takes. They're using the old school cone denim. They're, I guess they're about out of it. So they've sourced some Japanese denim, but anyway, M W Reynolds, visit them online here. M W Reynolds co on Instagram and go to a store, man, because this guy has been doing it for 20 fucking years. He has been slinging Japanese denim, Filson, uh, you know, American made goods and he knows his shit and he's a great, great guy. He's a huge music fan and he is a, uh, just a great, huge comedy fan. Also, he went and saw me, uh, with, uh, when I opened for Marcus King at the mission ballroom and I wish I saw him there. He's got a great fucking dog and a great store. So I wanted to give him a shout out. It's not an ad. I just, uh, I love these fucking stores. When I'm on the road, I go, oh yeah, I got to go to MW Reynolds, you know? I got to go down and just shoot the shit with them. I don't need anything. I'm fucking tapped. But then I'm in there and I'm like, you know what? I, I want to check out some of these, uh, these Raleigh denims. So anyway, I wanted to give them a shout out. A couple more things and we're fucking going to be out of here. I can't thank you guys enough once again. For all your kind words um, from the Berkeley show that were out there. And, um, oh, this, this is what I wanted to talk about. I was, uh, which, by the way, thanks for everybody asking about Gertie. She's over here. She got her um, cortisone shot. She's on some uh, mes muscle relaxers. And she is way, way better. And, man, I am so happy about that. I love this dog. And I did not want to see her in pain. She is just a beautiful creature. And she's doing way better. But I was out walking Gertie a little bit. I, I walk her a little bit because, uh, you know, her neck. She had a kink in her neck, which, like, Dad has now. My fucking neck, my shoulders, just from that ride, man, it's still fucking, still cooked. 
anyway, Gertie had a little pinched nerve in her neck, but she's doing way better. So I was out walking her a little bit. Gertie loves to go out walking in the neighborhood. This dog will sniff everything on the fucking block. And in my neighborhood, they were filming something. They were filming some, uh, you know, some movie or whatever. And there the whole street was closed off and they had the catering truck and they had the, the honey wagon dressing rooms and they, they, you know, the crew were all out there. I was walking Gertie really early uh, around 7 a.m. And it got me to thinking, I haven't done a, a movie in a long time, but I did a lot of movies for real uh, for, you know, in a real short period. I was on a sets a lot. And it got me thinking about how much I kind of miss that set vibe. It gets boring after, you know, a couple weeks. You're like, oh, but man, there's, there's nothing cooler than being on a movie set. It's like some kind of weird pirate ship moving around from location to location. And these amazing crew people come in and they set up the whole fucking day. Food, wardrobe makeup sound lighting all the riggers all the trucks all the uh the union people and they set up these days for these you know film shoots and then you come in and you do this weird fucking thing called acting now i'm not very good obviously but i wish that i you know was doing it more and more because when you do a movie by the third, fourth day, you start to fucking get into it. You start to figure it out. And it is a, uh, an amazing, you know, the art of acting, you know, it's like songwriting to me. These people, they, they discount it. Most people, they just, they just don't understand the amount of work that goes into uh, somebody like a fucking Robert Downey Jr. Or somebody like a, you know, uh, Joaquin Phoenix. These people that are beyond in acting. And I think about it. It's like when I watch Bill. This weekend, I watched Bill a lot because he's getting ready to do a special. And the thing I notice what makes Bill different than a lot of comedians and even myself is he'll take a topic and let's say it's politics or whatever. And he will, it, it won't just be like a one or two minute bit. It'll have all these different olive branches. He'll dive deep all the way down to where it's an actual piece. It is a full on piece. And, you know, I, I try to do that myself, but you have to keep grinding and working and being on stage and getting tags and, and more and more ideas and, you know, digging around on the internet. Let's say you're talking about fucking go-karts and you just, I remember Ari Shafir told me this one time, you talk about everything about a go-kart until you're fucking out. And then you find where the laughs are and that's the fucking piece. Well, these actors, man, they take it so fucking far and deep and, and just amazing. I've been listening to this Robert Downey Jr. Uh, Rick Rubin interview. And I just, uh, I love Robert Downey. I always wanted him on the podcast because just for, you know, the Tropic Thunder film alone, just to talk to him about that whole thing of how you're making this actual dark comedy masterpiece. Comedy films are so fucking hard to make because most of America, you know, by the time that people are making the comedy film, they vanilla it out the fucking joke so much. So everybody gets it. And the studios are worried, you know, that, uh, well, you know, we need some more fart jokes there, man. You know, you don't have enough fart jokes. And, um, so, you know, I'd love to talk to Robert Downey, but man, these guys is process a Sean Penn, 
all these kind of guys that just, that just, you know, so I'm, I'm walking in the neighborhood and I'm seeing this, you know, this film shoot set up and it just, I got like sentimental, man. I was like, I love movies and I love TV and the business is fucking whittling away. And I just know how much those people love being in the biz. You know, they could fucking drive a UPS truck. No, but they drive a truck with the fucking film gear in it. They're part of the fucking process. So anyway, it was, uh, it got me thinking, man, I wouldn't mind, you know, being on something again for a couple of weeks. Like when I went and did Judd Apatow's Love, man, it's just so great to be there. You're at catering, you're talking to people. Hey, man, oh, oh, fuck, that was funny, man, or whatever. And it's just, it's just a uh, an amazing process when people are making movies, no matter what level. I've done a bunch of small, no fucking budget movies, and I've done some big ass movies, and uh, everybody's always in the same. Uh, frame of mind hopefully where they're like man i hope we're doing something good here so anyway i just wanted to talk about that because it really took me back to like when i was doing that tarantino film hell ride and just being on the set with like dennis hopper and listening to his stories about apocalypse now and easy rider and colors and uh you know all these great films he had made just to hear that fucking knowledge from that guy it was just those kind of, you know, situations are just incredible to me. I sit back and I think about it like, oh my God, I did a film with Dennis Hopper, my all-time favorite, fucking Blue Velvet, Apocalypse Now, Colors. This guy's fucking a smoker, you know? Unbelievable. He directed Colors, by the way, if you didn't know. Just the iconic early venice gang movie the crack era just great with of course sean penn pac-man fuck you pac-man anyway big ups to the film industry man i do not want it to go away i go to the movie theaters i pay i buy a ticket i want to see this new um this biker film fuck what's it called biker uh my guy over there uh, biker Thing, bike riders there it is is that it let me yeah here it is bike riders it's finally coming out i heard the rundown on it it was made and then disney said this is too violent we uh, aren't going to put it out and they shelved it and then uh, it's finally coming out austin butler tom hardy i'm ready to see this so uh i'm gonna go to the theater to see that i love going to the fucking theater i love seeing the movies there's nothing better. I went to Oppenheimer twice. I went twice, I tell you. I went twice. Anyway, all right. I got to get out of here. And uh, I love you guys. Before I get out, I want to give a special um, thank you for 30 years of uh, brick and mortar business, 415 Clothing in San Francisco. They are uh, shutting their doors. They will still be mail order. So you can still get everything on their website. They just won't have a brick and mortar anymore. But they've been uh, 30 years, family-owned business, selling some of the greatest uh, motorcycle vests and, and kick-ass T-shirts and, and amazing um, you know hoodies and biker belts. All If you are into biker culture, you're going to want to uh, go to 415 Clothing. And they're having their party on the 23rd, the closing party. So I love you, 415 Clothing. I've, I've known you guys for most of my life, and I've bought stuff from you, you know, my entire uh, entire time that I knew about you guys. And, and I love you guys, your family. And uh, congratulations on 30 years. Now, they are not closed. They will be selling, and that's the same thing that M.W. Reynolds was telling me. Ever since COVID, it is a mail order online buying uh, business now, which is sad because I love brick and mortar. I like to go in, like I said, I go into 415 Clothing, see my friends, laugh, put on the stuff, see it. Okay, this looks good on me. Oh, this is too big. Ah, uh, maybe this isn't for me. Oh, I got to have this. 
And that whole thing of leaving your fucking house and going down to a place, opening the door, you know, ding, 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 little jangly fucking bell to let the uh, people know that someone's in there. And then just in, people, you know, communication, human conversation. That's going away, man. Brick and mortar. That's why I shout these stores out all the time. Standard and Strange, Self Edge, 415 Clothing. All these people, they just, uh, you know, I, I love them. I love fucking shops. I love them. So congratulations, 415 Clothing. They are not going away. They are just, uh, just getting rid of the brick and mortar after all these years. San Francisco's tough. Rents are high. And, uh, you know, they're doing mostly mail order. So I get it. Anyway, salute to you guys. I love it. And I love all you guys. Thanks for tuning in. And thank you for coming to all the shows out there. And once again, happy birthday to the great Bill Burr today. 56 years old. I love you. And uh, candles lit for all of you guys.